So the rules of engagement in this uh, section, it's called the show and tell section. And um, so it's eight minute talks um, with a couple of minutes for a question, probably one question I should think, or perhaps two if they're quick. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll uh, sit at the front and after six minutes I'll come up um, uh, so just to indicate that you've got two minutes left. So uh, Abel, could, could I ask you to come up please? So the first, so we've got six talks. The first talk is from Abel Packer, so we are sticking with the Latin America theme for the moment. Um, and uh, Abel's going to talk about the interna internationalization of the Cielo Brazil journey. Yes, thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, congratulations to the association for this very well organized meeting and uh, for the program also. Uh, and, for, and for the speakers, except me. You know. Okay, so uh, continuing on Latin America, I will talk now the share with you the effort we are doing to promote the internationalization of the Cielo journals. You know. Uh, Cielo is a network with 18 years of operation already. We launched it four years before the Budapest Declaration. We have now 15 countries, 12 for Latin America, plus Spain, Portugal, and South Africa. Uh, we, the network produces about 52,000 documents per year. We have accumulated more than 500, and we have 1 million downloads per day following the counter uh, principles. Okay, the main goals are improve journals and the research they communicate, and improve visibility, use impact, and the credibility. So in terms of impact, which is a critical issue in our program and in the science in Latin America, most of the journals we uh, index and publish are below the median of the <laughs> distribution of indicators, you know, all around. And this is, has an explanation. You know? Most of the, 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 the nature of research are applied research, you know? uh, low international collaboration, and also local language, Portuguese and Spanish. So this complex of, of situation makes it, of course, difficult to compete for citation abroad. So we are moving forward with a strategy to improve the quality uh, of the journal. So we have three lines of action that we define as professionalization, internationalization, and financial sustainability. You know? and in terms of Brazil, uh, the insertion that we are promoting <laughs> in the international flow of scientific information includes Indexing in the sense that 100% of the journals are indexed in, in, in Google Scholar, of course, and Cielo Citation Index, we see the Web of Science platform. We are looking now in the new methodology to have 100% of the journals in, in Director of Open Access Journal as a criteria of, let's say, good practice in open access, and also <laughs> we are in cross half. About 70% are indexed either in Scopus or Web of Science. We have uh, services that we contract, for example, with Digital Science, with RediCube, Automatic, and Fixture. 42% uh, <coughs> of the journal are operating with Scholar One, 30% with OGS, and, and the other with own systems. Uh, we have as a standard 100% of journals following JETS methodology, and we have today 80% of journal with Creative Commons, uh, with by attribution, and we expect it to move to 95% in 2008. We <coughs> also improve our international association with QASP, uh, WASP, sorry. DOAJ counter, ALPSP, and the, the dimensions that we are working in the internationalization are the management of the journal in terms of evaluation of manuscripts, authorship to bring more foreign authors, and also language. So we define the targets that the areas or the, the, the group of journals are expected to 
uh, <laughs> achieve in the near future. So we work with these areas. I will go through it very fast. Some of them are basically nationally oriented, like agriculture, for example, no? which is driven for the, uh, let's say, tropical agriculture in Brazil, and they bring extraordinary contribution to the development of and the, the research related uh, are pu mainly published in Portuguese. So when we look to uh, how many uh, percentage of uh, manuscripts that are evaluated by international peer review, we can see that most are still uh, by uh, Brazilian or foreign. And we define as a target by 2022, 20, seven years more, to have 25 of the articles evaluated by uh, foreign researchers. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, affiliation, international authoring, uh, we have now in the entire Cielo 21% of authors from, from, from other countries, affiliation, and we define it as minimum for <laughs> 2015, 20%. So we are okay. For uh, 2020, five years more, uh, we expect to have a minimum and uh, have uh, about 35%. This is a major problem, of course, because most of the journal uh, were developed from the beginning uh, uh, with the national community. So move to get more manuscripts from outside the scope. Language, uh, <laughs> English language, 10 years of evolution, we almost double the number of English journal from uh, English articles from 36% to 62. And the perspective is to have 75 English and 50% in Portuguese. Uh, and we have this uh, effort to publish both in Portuguese and English, okay? So this is the table with its distribution. So how we are moving forward, we are trying to align national policies that promote in one side the internationalization and the other side that the research needed to address national problems. So it's a, a balance that you need to do there. We are trying to develop our partnerships and alliance, moving to open science, optimize resources allocation in terms of minimizing the operational cost to make uh, viable open access and at the same time be uh, competitive internationally. Of course, quality control, uh, follow-up performance. And the idea <coughs> that we are doing is to show uh, the perceived gains that we have with internationalization no? and of course to overcome resistance, share with our colleagues from other countries. Thank you. So I'm, I'm just, I, I apologies if I missed this, okay. uh, but did you talk about um, recruiting editors at all to supplement? Yep. The, recruiting editors yeah, yeah, and so. peer reviewers. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay? Okay, thank all you. Right. Thank you very much. All right, so the um, next speaker is uh, David Solomon um, from uh, Michigan. Um, David's gonna talk, uh, David was actually one of the founding um, uh, directors, founders of, of OASPA, so, um, and he's going to talk about a, a really interesting project funded by the Harvard Office of Scholarly Communications on journal flipping. So, thank you. I'll come up thanks, next. Mark. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for inviting me, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, and in particular, Peter Suber, who uh, allowed us to do this project and took on the unenviable task of having to edit it. Uh, which is a, a major job. Uh, and it was funded by Arcadia Foundation and Harvard's library, and I want to thank them. Uh, this was mainly a literature review looking at journals, how, how journals transition from subscription to OA. And um, 
it, uh, in doing it was made to, uh, mainly a, a literature review, but we did interview uh, eight people uh, who were very helpful. I think at least two of them here, uh, uh, Caroline Sutton and Rain Crow. I don't know if anybody else is here in the list, uh, uh, but uh, that was very helpful as well. And it was an open uh, review process. Uh, the first draft was put out. Uh, I expect some of you saw that, and we took comments, uh, went through, and uh, did some revisions and then uh, Peter picked about uh, 20 experts in the field. I know a number of you out in the audience who he sent out to and, and gave a whole, uh, we got a whole lot more comments and those are right embedded in the report and uh, almost doubled the length and really enriched it. Uh, I was a little uh, concerned about how that would work but it actually worked extremely well and I appreciate all your, your support in doing that. Um, uh, again, the, the goal was to look at how subscription journals transition to OA, how that could be done, the various ways it's been done, and, and what are the outcomes, uh, not only the economic outcomes, but also in terms of submissions, uh, readership, quality measures, and other factors that are influenced by the transition to OA. And we used a pretty standard definition of OA, uh, basically immediate free access under open licenses. We included journals that um, uh, 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 kept their, their subscription uh, printed journals but made their digital, ver uh, uh, digital copies uh, uh, open access. Uh, we we uh, looked at hybrid and uh, delayed open access, but only as a transition strategy to full OA, not as an outcome, as unfortunately that usually is the case. Um, and um, uh, again, this was mainly a very comprehensive uh, literature review. Most of the literature out there is not in the published literature. It's in the gray literature uh, in terms of blog posts, uh, uh, press releases, reports, and other types of, of literature. And we looked at all that, probably looked at about 500 uh, pieces of literature, narrowed it down to 200 or so that were uh, really relevant and, uh, and reviewed those. And we also made a, um, uh, basically an annotated bibliography since we uh, had our notes from that. Uh, and again, we solicited experts uh, in the field, got their uh, opinions, and we looked at about 110 journals. And uh, as Mackenzie Smith noted in one of her comments, that's really only a small sample. There's probably, my guess, nobody knows for sure, probably some, uh, my guess is somewhere between 2,000, 3,000 uh, journals that have transitioned uh, from subscription to OA. But for most of those, there's literally nothing out there. Uh, we looked, and in an earlier study, looked very carefully to try to find uh, uh, information on specific journals, how they flipped, and there's literally not even a press release out there for most of them. Um, uh, Actually, this slide was supposed to be left, I apologize. Um, and, and we took that information and we tried to organize it into what we call scenarios, which are kind of models for flipping. Uh, and it was kind of hard to do because there isn't real, it doesn't fall into nice, easy categories. So we tried to do that and then looked at the advantages and disadvantages to each. We did a SWOT analysis and we uh, tried to have examples. We ended up with 10 scenarios for APC funded OA and about five for uh, other forms of funding. Uh, uh, that's just how it kind of seemed to break down for us. Uh, and the key findings, uh, first of all, every journal situation is different. Uh, and and it's, it's hard, there's no one model that works well for journals. There's so many differences in terms of uh, discipline, location, the organization that owns the journal, whether they change publishers or not. So it's hard to say, uh, you know, anything that works well for all journals. There did seem to be uh, 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 one factor that came through, and that's the economics of the uh, existing model. We, on one end of the scale, we found journals that were literally in a flip or die situation that uh, they were about to be shut down, but the editorial board or the editor just was about determined to keep it going and, and switched to an OA model and was able to make it work. Uh, there were a lot more journals that were you know, just not, not ready to 
uh, be shut down, but uh, were transitioned in part, not fully, but in part because it was a better economic model for them. And these are not bad journals in any sense. Oftentimes they, they have narrow scopes or not part of a big deal. And it's kind of tough for some journals to get enough subscriptions to keep running and they can function better as OA journals. Usually as APC funded, but not always, not always. Uh, but after uh, the other end of the scale, there's journals that are very, very lucrative, and even if they're owned by a nonprofit uh, uh, foundation or nonprofit society, whose OA would be a better fit with the goals, it's difficult to switch uh, to flip those journals because it's hard to give up that income stream. So you know, economics kind of matters, uh, not surprisingly. Flipping is a process, we found out. It, it, there's a lot involved in flipping, uh, and uh, uh, it's a process that it takes resources, not only resources to fund publication, but there's extra resources to uh, flip, particularly if the journal flips uh, or, or switches to a different publisher, which is often the case, and uh, you have to uh, change journal management systems. Uh, uh, societies have their own unique issues because basically they're democracies and you have to, the, you know, the, the membership really runs the society and you have to get the approval of the, the society. And, and finally, uh, I just want to say that uh, publishing, as you well know, I'm speaking to the choir, is an open-ended commitment and though uh, volunteer uh, labor can be very helpful if you rely heavily on volunteer labor. It's difficult to do that over the long haul, and journals, we saw journals that failed because of that. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Questions for David? Can Thank I, you. I'll ask, I'll ask one. Oh, okay, yeah. sure. So, I, so I was uh, I'm pretty amazed by the, the comment that you made that you said there were two to 3,000 journals that you think, I mean, what, so what's that based? Yeah, so right. well, the, we did a study about two years ago where we took the journals in the DOAJ, we uh, ran them against the journals in uh, Scopus, we found, uh, 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 and, and just by looking at the journals we found, we found over a thousand of them that we're almost positive were uh, transitioned because they were, you know, launched in 1922 or something, and uh, and, and that's what we found out. Because then we because we, we were looking at the uh, increase in citations and uh, 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 publications for OA journals over time over uh, the first 10 years of the century, and we had to find out where they flipped, or we couldn't tell whether it was before or after they. they and, and literally, you know, we had to make some educated guesses because there's just no information out there, right. even though we knew they flipped. So there was at least a thousand there. And I, I just, you know, we, we, we think that we're guessing it's somewhere in there. Okay, all right. Thank yeah. you very much. Mm -hmm. Great. Right. Uh, next, we have uh, Amy Cannell, um, who is from Springer Nature. And Amy is going to talk about all aspects of data policy and practice. Hi, um, so my name is Amy Canal, and I'm going to speak to you about our first major data project at Springer Nature uh, after the merger. Um, and this is our data policy project. The aim of the project was to roll out a data policy to every single journal at Springer Nature. Um, you might say, well, that doesn't sound like the most exciting data project I've ever heard of. Uh, but we found it was foundational to building more services and technology around data. Um, we also found there was a huge need for a standardized data policy across all of our journals. Um, this is a project, a GIST project, looking at hoping to build a, a data policy registry uh, for uh, policy, data policies for journals uh, to help guide authors around data policy. And one of the things they found was, uh, in trying to do this, that the current data policy ecosystem uh, was uh, just too confusing and ambiguous and dramatically needed standardization. Uh, we found the same thing internally looking at our own data policies, um, or sometimes lack thereof, across Springer Nature journals. 
Um, and meanwhile, this is becoming more and more of an issue for authors, as funders uh, now include uh, data deposition mandates as part of their grant requirements. Uh, now around 30 research funders globally have a, a requirement for data deposition. Um, and most of these policies started with open access policies. So if we consider what this might look like in the future, we can see it's only growing. So what, is this, uh, what was this policy or this project specifically? So we started with creating a list of features that we thought were uh, made up a data policy. And these would be everything from not only data deposition, guidance to authors, but uh, data citation, data availability statements. Uh, the list go goes on. And from that, uh, we found uh, we asked, what, what is the minimum if we want to give best practice to our authors around uh, data policy and really enhance our, our research and make it more reproducible, re reproducible? What is the minimum data policy? And with that, we came up with type one. And this is a policy we felt every journal could adhere to, even um, you know, the most uh, in a humanities and social science journal or um, a, a very bespoke society journal. Um, so this is just encouraging data sharing, and it's providing all the guidance an author needs to share their data according to best practice. Um, we called them types for political reasons, but they get um, more uh, sort of stringent as you go up. Uh, type three, uh, it, it encourages data sharing for all types of data, however, where there is a community established norm for data sharing, such as in genomics and proteomics, uh, data deposition is actually mandated. Uh, the other thing that's mandated on this level is uh, statements around data availability. So if you've shared your data or not, you have to say uh, where or why. Uh, journals on this level would be, for example, all of the Biomed Central journals, as well as Nature and the Nature Research Group journals. And finally, type four is our most stringent uh, data, uh, data level, and that is mandating data sharing across all journals, um, as well as peer review of data. And so this would be journals like Scientific Data and Genome Biology. We found that um, this usually needed an in-house editor Uh, so as part of this project, we also created uh, a whole, um, so this wasn't just about uh, creating workflows and standardized processes internally. A huge part of this project was creating resources for our editors and authors so they could take ownership and have the support they need to, to uh, adhere to these policies. So things like um, standardized text on data availability statements, uh, a publisher help desk, which that specifically has been critical. All of these are online, and much of it is open for reuse. So where are we now? Uh, we launched the project in July. Currently, we have over 400 journals uh, that have been rolled out onto a, a policy level. Uh, that includes all of the Biomed Central journals and the Nature Research Group journals, as well as some subscription journals from the Springer Research Group. Uh, within October, we hope to roll this out to all of the Springer Open journals, and by the end of the year, we hope to have uh, over a thousand journals uh, that have a policy rolled out onto it. Um, so future plans. Uh, one interesting thing that's happened since we started talking about this and rolling this out um, is there's been uh, a lot of feedback that there needs to be wider community adoption of standardized data policies. Um, so we've had interest from JISC, obviously, um, as, as they clearly had an interest in this before, um, but also from the Force 11 Publisher Data Citation Group, which I chair, uh, for standardized data availability statements, as well as um, the Research Data Alliance. Um, seeing if we can not only standardize text around data policy, but um, around data availability statements. And finally, um, we're also looking to better understand the costs in terms of time of things like quality checks around uh, data policy, as well as uh, the benefits of uh, certain 
aspects of research data policy. So um, articles with data availability statements, do they have increased citations, things like this. So what we've learned, um, first you need a, an achievable uh, level, that's our level one. Uh, don't try to solve uh, everything at once. Um, except that you're going to have some difficult one-on-one -on -one conversations with, say, society journals. Um, acknowledge that there are community differences and what works for genomics is not going to work for, say, computer science. Um, identifying examples across all or across some key subject areas has really been useful in terms of communication. Um, again, be prepared to get your hands dirty. There's been a lot of one-on-one -on -one journal conversations. Um, and you know, we found that even though this, um, so a, as we started looking more at services and technology around data and what we can do with that, it's really reinforced what we thought from the very beginning, which is at the foundation, you have to have a policy and guidance to authors on what they should be doing around data. Otherwise, the things you're building on top of that, uh, aren't, you can't take full advantage of them. And of course, we're, we're still learning. Come on. <laughs> are you all itching to have the AGM, are you? Is that, is that the issue? Um, OK, I, I have a question then. Um, so you talked about sort of community standards and things. So uh, uh, top, the top guidelines, are they, did you look at them in relation to the work that you're doing? Was that useful or? Um, yes, and we, we had looked at them bef before as well because they go beyond data, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, this. Uh, and, and, and these levels adhere to the, the top guidelines in some, in some areas. Um, but I think this data policy, the features are more detailed in, in right. some way. So they'll even go to a level of uh, integrating with the submission system mm -hmm. at some point. So it was more, it was, in some areas, it's, it's, too, it's more internal. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. I have a quick question. It's Meredith from Dryad. Thank you for that, Amy. I've been following this for a while, and it's really, really exciting to see. I wondered if you could describe just quickly, um, on that type two, I think it was described as evidence of data sharing or examples. What, what would that be like? So um, type two is encouragement not only of data deposition, but also encouragement of transparency or evidence around it. So encouragement of data availability statements would be what that is. Thank you. And they're all, they're, all of the levels are actually more detailed than that. That is just the very simplified differences. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. OK. Thanks. <laughs> right. Next is Catherine Funk from uh, PubMed Central uh, to talk about interagency public access efforts. All right, hi, I'm Katie Funk. Um, you can grab me and call me Catherine. I might not reply, um, but, but I try to be professional, especially when I'm not wearing my blazer. Uh, so I've been working uh, with the National Library of Medicine and uh, within the sphere of public access since about 2010. Um, I am with the National Library of Medicine. I think that makes me US government and therefore firmly in the bureaucratization that uh, Heather mentioned earlier, but I like to think we also play a bit of a part in the success here. Um, I usually give this chat to librarians, so I wanted to just take advantage really quickly um, in a room of publishers to thank you for the support that you do give authors. Um, I think you are a huge part of why public access has succeeded in the US, and so please continue to do so. Um, I tried to come up with a super sexy title for this talk. Uh, it may just be that the topic itself is not super sexy, but uh, what I really want to focus on here today is within PMC what we're doing for public access um, or green open access or whatever you like to think of it as where you're, where you're coming from. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with PubMed Central, we are a full text 
archive. We try to call ourselves PMC in the most failed attempt at rebranding ever to differentiate ourselves from PubMed. But PubMed is citations, we're full text. There's a, s a drastic volume difference as well. So those things you can kind of keep in mind. Um, additionally, um, most of my focus is going to be on public access within the US government, but I can take questions on anything <laughs> within reason. Uh, so, PMC, we've been a funder repository really since 2005. Uh, it's only one of the roles that we play. Uh, PMC predates public access, uh, and we started out as a journal repository. When NIH created a voluntary public access policy in 2005, um, we got into this second role that we now serve. Uh, and it's since 2008, uh, the US PMC has really been the repository for NIH and HHMI, and everything was lovely, and we kind of went along that way until about 2013, when the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy issued the OSTP memo. And I will let Jerry give you the OSTP memo slide tomorrow. It's scintillating, so I won't steal his thunder. Um, but uh, at this point now, uh, PMC is serving as the repository for all of the other health and human services agencies. Um, I'm wearing my bureaucratic badge proudly here, dropping all of these acronyms on you, so bear with me. Um, we also are going to be supporting NASA, VA, EPA, and NIST uh, public access. And all of these are in varying stages of implementation, so don't send me your EPA papers tomorrow. Um, additionally, outside of the government, we are now the repository for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Health Research Alliance, and then most of you are likely familiar with Europe PubMed Central, who supports about 27-ish funders. And then uh, in Canada, the uh, CIHR also uses PMC as their repository. Um, so. With that in mind, uh, this can be really intimidating, I think, uh, but the truth is the volume of what we're talking about here in sort of the new era of um, public access is not as scary as you might think. I like to call this my it's going to be okay slide. Um, so if you are used to supporting NIH public access, they have about 100,000 papers that they fund a year annually. Um, it drops off significantly after that due to research R&D budgets within the US government. Uh, most people don't have an NIH-sized R&D budget. So NASA has about 10,000, et cetera, et cetera, on down. Um, I also think uh, within that NASA uh, example, there's a, an interesting story in that a librarian from the International Space Station, she's not on the space station, that would be the best librarian job ever. <laughs> um, but uh, so she works for the ISS group and she wanted to make sure that their research was um, publicly accessible. So she gave me a list of 80 papers and she says, we want to make sure these are in PMC. And when I went through that list, nearly half of them already were. So we're already looking at, because of journals that have relationships with PMC, these papers are already being made publicly accessible. I think a lot of them came from like PLOS One or scientific reports. Additionally, uh, because of co-funding, papers are already being made available in PMC. Uh, you're not gonna see this super well, but much of the HHS and VA, there's a lot of overlap there. So there's everything within reason. Um, and I wanted to be mindful of time. I have like a 40 minute version of this talk, but since uh, I have eight minutes today, I really wanted to focus on the two questions that I get most often from publishers, which is concerning scope of PMC and then how to get the papers in. So, the scope issue. Uh, for those of you who are library nerds, you have maybe read the NLM collection development policy I think there's two people in the room who can probably say that, um, but basically, if you've ever deposit, tried to apply with a journal to PMC that was not biomedical or life sciences, and we said this is out of scope, that is because NLM has a mission, and that mission is to, create, to collect research um, in biomedicine and other areas of the life sciences. So we do have a scope thing going on, and I think there's a threshold of about 20% of a journal has to fall in that uh, biomedicine, life science realm for it to be considered for the collection. 
So <laughs> this raises the question of, okay, NIST is the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. You have NASA, who they're all about life, but unlike Mars. So, um, so we're, we, uh, when this OSTP memo came out, it was something we really had to look at, whether we were willing to do this for other <laughs> agencies. And so uh, we have NASA and NIST coming on, as I mentioned, but this is also in support of what we see within NIH, which is that there's more interdisciplinary science being done all the time. NIH is funding a massive amount of research in engineering and computer sciences now, and so these, these walls are already being kind of torn down. The second question, how do you get your papers into PMC? Now this is not gonna change, so if you have an EPA-funded researcher, you still get to deal with this. So uh, some of you may be familiar with what the NIH kind of puts out, which is sort of an alphabet soup of method A, B, C, D. Um, there's really two ways pe papers get into PMC. Uh, your journal may have an agreement with us to do so, um, or your publisher may have an agreement with us to do so, and they will submit the final version directly to us, and you can do that for any of the funded content that we support, not like, my mom funded this. Um, so, uh, but then if, you're, if a journal does not have an agreement with us, if you are a publisher who does not have an agreement with us, your authors still have the option to use the manuscript submission system and those come into PMC through that route. Uh, everything that comes into PMC is also given a corresponding citation in PubMed. It's mirrored in Europe PMC and Canada PMC. And then as of last year, uh, the manuscripts themselves, I wanted to highlight this since it came up earlier, um, that fall under these policies are being made available uh, in text and data mining format for bulk download. So that was a step that was initiated by the NIH in about November 2015. Um, just to sort of wrap things up, uh, this is my, my kind of tie it all together slide. Um, it is a story where if you have read Vice President Biden's cancer moonshot speech, he uses it, I used it first. I got it from Neil deGrasse Tyson, so take it for what it's worth. It's also my opportunity to do, use gratuitous NASA images. But um, I think it speaks to the point Heather made earlier that we're doing open in order to. PMC does not take in these papers just because we find it fun. Uh, we believe in the cross-pollinization of science. Um, and that by making things available from different, public, or from different fields all in one place, medical researchers can benefit from what physics people are doing and that sort of thing. Uh, really quickly, what this story illustrates is how two experiences from the Hubble, uh, being up there in the sky, uh, the first, for those of you who have watched the NOVA documentary, it's very moving, they had a very blurry images that were coming back and so they went up and they, they used image, or well first they used imaging technology. They now use that imaging technology in uh, trying to locate breast cancer. They then went up to actually fix the telescope and that is now using, being used in biopsies. So the stuff that's being done in space and beyond is contributing to health research here and I think that's NLM's role in this. So thank you. Oh, I knew I wouldn't get away without questions. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, can I just ask a question about your flowchart that you briefly showed there? Yes. So um, in the case of, I think what you said is that if an article um, is uh, open access and an APC has been paid, even if the journal is not part of your normal, doesn't have an agreement with you guys, you will still take the article from a publisher. Is that right? Okay. So. We'll dive into the methods. Um, so if we have to have an established agreement with you, either at the journal level or at the publisher level, um, if we don't, we can take the paper, but we take it through the manuscript submission system. So it is usually, it's deposited in the NIHMS in Word or PDF format, and we reformat it into XML, which we make available in PMC. Um, but is it the case that with some funders, uh, whatever journal the article's been in, you will still accept the article? Yes. So, sorry if I misunderstood the question. Um, if I have 
NIH funding and I publish in a mathematics journal, we will accept that paper, even though that mathematics journal may be out of scope for NLM. Does that make sense? Okay. And, and how do you choose those funders? Uh, they usually, they approach us um, and express interest in participating in PMC. We do not go out and uh, hawk our wares. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thanks very much. Sure. Okay. Next, we have uh, Katie Foxall, who's head of publishing at eCancer, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the real world um, of impacts of open access. Hello, I'm Katie Foxall, definitely not Catherine. Um, so I'm head of publishing at eCancer. Um, some of you may not have heard of it. It's a multimedia oncology journal, and we've been publishing open access for nearly 10 years now. So I'm going to talk to you today about the benefits of open access for um, cancer research, um, both to researchers and to patients and the general public. Um, and I'll talk to you a bit about the work that eCancer is also doing in this, in this area. So earlier this year, US Vice President Joe Biden um, declared a certain sympathy with the open science and open access movement. He said that American taxpayers fund $5 billion in cancer research every year, but nearly all of that research sits behind walls. Tell me how this is moving the process along more rapidly. Um, in 2010, the total annual cost of cancer was estimated to reach 1.16 trillion US dollars. Um, but this is the real kicker. About half of all cancers could be avoided if current knowledge was adequately implemented. So the research is being done, you know, they're coming up with cures, but it's not being adequately implemented and people are, are dying as a result. Cancer research is a very high quality, um, but it's uncoordinated and slow in translating benefits to patients. Um, and this is actually why eCancer was, was founded nearly 10 years ago, um, to try and break down the barriers that are restricting the, the free sharing uh, and communication of the results of cancer research worldwide. Um, one example of this um, I want to talk about is the Euro Cancer Comms project. Um, this is a EU-funded project, um, FP7 at the time, and eCancer was included as, as the dissemination partner. So as part of this project, um, the European Association of Cancer Research, the EACR, surveyed cancer researchers regarding their attitudes to open access publishing. Uh, respondents were asked how often the articles they wished to consult were unavailable because they did not have free access to a particular sus subscription journal. So almost 59% of respondents indicated that a lack of access sometimes or often slowed down their work. Um, and the comments bank revealed that valuable time is spent on attempts, often futile, to find what's needed. So they were trying to find the PDFs from their colleagues and sometimes they were getting them, sometimes they weren't, but it was hindering um, their research. Um, this is the situation for oncology professionals in Europe. Uh, there are even more obstacles in the paths of um, healthcare professionals in lower and middle income countries. So now I'll go on to the situation for cancer patients and the general public. A 2015 study showed that people are much more likely to want to read the latest research compared to the past. Um, it can be a powerful tool to help people to take responsibility for their own health. Um, prevention is a hot topic at the moment. The more people can learn about the tree impact of behaviours such as smoking, overeating, not exercising, the better. Uh, patients are becoming more and more empowered, researching their particular illness as much as possible. Uh, they're even becoming involved in the peer review and publication of scientific research. This is the BMC journal, um, Research Involvement and Engagement, and that's actually co-produced with patients um, because it, it sees them as key stakeholders. So it's at this point I'd like to play a video featuring Professor Gordon McVie. So he's the co-founder of eCancer and he's a world expert in cancer research. I'm hoping this is going to work. This did work before, I promise. <laughs> I'm Gordon McVie. I'm the editor of eCancer. It's almost nine years that Professor Umberto Veronese and I co-founded the charity eCancer Medical Science. 2007, the barriers were all about 
money, the expense of accessing and buying subscriptions to journals. Geography was a big issue. A lot of people in lower income countries could not access journals on anything. And then, uh, of course, language. Uh, and that's the last barrier, and we're still busy at eCancer addressing that. Nine years on, we have a dynamic, really successful journal, which is open access in all its meanings, and it's free. We were really keen to publish open access because as well as reaching out to researchers and being able to take us one step forwards from a research perspective, we also wanted health professionals and arts practitioners and patients and public to know about the data. eCancer is a multimedia publication and we have the largest library of key opinion leader videos in the world and they have been watched 13.4 million times. We've already decided to tackle some of the issues of language. We publish articles and videos now in Spanish and in Portuguese, and we are working in educational modules in sub-Saharan Africa, on palliative care and in India and in all the countries of Latin America. Our ultimate aim since the beginning has been to uh, get better patient care for every cancer patient, whatever they are in the world. We thought that educating the professionals and giving them the tools of the up-to-date knowledge free and quickly would be the answer. It's only part of the answer. The other part is the patient. And we came to realise early on in the course of eCancer that a lot of patients were coming to, uh, to the website and looking at the articles and, uh, and looking at the videos. So we developed eCancer Patient, especially for them. Patients can see the videos which we've shot with professional to professionals and they are cut into small parts with the bibliography or the meanings of the words after each of the two-minute sections. At eCancer, we've got a definition of patient empowerment, which is not handing a leaflet to a patient and saying, go away and read that. Our definition is giving patients the tools for them to uh, understand, to quiz, uh, to uh, formulate uh, a view, and be able to have the courage to ask questions of the doctor and to come to informed decisions together with the doctor. As an engineer, I like to have every part of the information available to me to make a decision. There are lots of researchers out there that contradict each other and actually as, an, as a patient, you, you need to be confident in yourself you're picking the right direction because it's your life at the end of the day. We have shown that open access works. We've shown that it's effective. We've shown that the doctors and the healthcare professionals and the scientists appreciate it. So it seems pretty clear that being able to access the research directly can improve the public's knowledge of developments in oncology. But the key here is that these sources are actually trustworthy and peer reviewed. Um, I've included here a list of things that the Daily Mail, which is a UK tabloid newspaper, said give you cancer. As you can see, some quite unusual things such as flip flops, soup. Um, being a woman, being a man, this is only a very small part of the list. Um, <laughs> it won't, this won't confuse people who are from the UK, this is what the Daily Mail does. Um, so uh, this, the, the research is often uh, sensationalised, um, they don't include caveats to account for scientific uncertainty, um, and you know, a lot of people don't know whether what they're reading is actually true or not. So I've got a couple of case studies to um, demonstrate the issues we're facing when trying to report the results of cancer research accurately and responsibly. The first is an article on the benefits of singing in a choir for cancer patients, survivors and caregivers, uh, which was published in April this year. Um, so it was the first report proving that singing in a choir for just one hour boosts levels of immune proteins in people affected by cancer. Um, as you may remember from the video I played earlier on, uh, one of the authors of the study, Dr. Daisy Fancourt, uh, was very concerned with making sure that patients and the general public were able to read the results of her research. Um, one of the author's main objectives was to increase the number of participants for cancer choirs run by the charity Ten of Us. So a very successful press campaign was carried out. Um, the authors were invited to be interviewed on various TV channels, including the BBC and many well-respected global news outlets. Uh, we estimate that around um, 3 million people were reached in this way. However, some of the news outlets overstated the findings with headlines such as singing in a choir could help beat cancer, which is not correct, unfortunately. Um, the NHS Behind the Headlines website published a piece which pointed out the limitations in the study, which had been clearly stated in the article but completely ignored by some of the media. Uh, because the article's open access, this piece was able to link to it directly so people could read the research for themselves. 
Um, ten of us reported a large spike in new choir participants who've joined as a result of the study's publication. Um, and they've also said that they've been um, approached by other organisations. Um, so they're sharing best practice. So other organisations which carry out health and care interventions um, who said they wouldn't be able to access journals directly to, to read about this. And all of them um, from all around the world who've contacted ten of us said they did read the original article directly themselves. Um, as for patients, they've also been reading the article. One patient said that she um, researches her condition and doctors do listen to me as long as I can quote the source of my information or have some data to prove what I'm saying. So she read um, this article and she joined a choir subsequently. She's, she's a cancer sufferer um, and that was a really great result for her. But um, she didn't have um, unrealistic expectations. She obviously realised it wasn't going to actually get rid of her cancer. She could read the paper and she could make her own decision about whether it would be personally beneficial. Um, and she said, I think it would be great to have free access to research papers. I've never paid to look at any. Just the process of signing up is so daunting. Um, another example of the importance of open access of cancer research is the Repurposing Drugs and Oncology Project. Um, so this is a charitable organisation that researches a wide range of low-cost drugs that may be suitable for repurposing due to their anti-cancer properties, but which have not been investigated due to a lack of financial incentive for pharmaceutical companies. Um, success with even one of these repurposed drugs would have a significant impact on improving cancer care in India, Africa or South America, uh, as well as in the developed world. Uh, nine papers have been published so far, all in e-cancer, uh, with a long list of drugs to re research in the future. So the author of the study, uh, Dr. Pan Pansiaka, said, it's extremely important to us that these articles are open access. There is such high interest to other charities and to researchers in lower and middle income countries who are both less likely to be able to afford subscription fees. And they've reported that they've been contacted by groups in India, Argentina and Brazil to express support or to find out more. So in many um, lower and income countries, up to 50% of cancer patients never even see a health worker. So there's an urgent need to increase public awareness of cancer prevention and treatment. And this goes hand in hand with making sure that oncology professionals uh, are aware of the latest developments as well. So it's initiatives like these which eCancer is developing that pave the pathway towards better treatment for cancer patients worldwide. Open access is more than simply a business model, it's a game changer which has the power to break down serious global inequalities in access to the results of cancer research. As Dr. Pansiaka of the Redo Project says, this is a case of saving money and lives. It isn't just about medical breakthroughs, it's about social necessity worldwide. Thank you. Okay, I think we should probably move on, actually. So thank you very much, Katie. So last but by no means least is uh, Jennifer Lynn from Crossref, who is going to talk about how Crossref is helping to support effective discovery and use of open access content. So, oh, and we're just going to have a slight technical change over. Actually, while we're doing that, I'll take the opportunity. Yes. I've, uh, we found this thing. It's like a security fob thingy. Um, so, if someone's lost one of these, um, I've tried all the bank accounts I know, and it doesn't work. Uh, oh, you've, okay, good. I'll bring it over. Sorry, technical difficulties. This is what happens when you carry a MacBook with two ports, one for the headphones and one for the power, as you end up relying on the grace of others. <laughs> Okay, let's go ahead and get started. 
Good afternoon. I realize that I'm the very last speaker before the thrilling business meeting, which then precedes the dinner and all of the social activities that follow. So we'll go ahead and dive right in. Um, Heather this morning brought up the question of endgame for OA um, and the need to coalesce around a single vision um, a, across a diverse, distributed set of stakeholders. Um, in my mind, it does look very similar, to, um, though not exactly the, the same to the one that she put forward, but similar in that it is very much directed at utility and the broader research communications ecosystem. Open access to scholarly research for open use of scholarly research. That's really the engine that drives the enterprise of research itself, is it not? While we continue the work of nailing that down, we do agree, I hear, from many of the themes brought forward today that OA makes research content more powerful, able to be read, shared, discovered, consumed, reviewed, remixed, and built upon in unlimited ways long before and after the version of record appears in a journal. The moment of sharing and reviewing or posting and discussing has extended these days beyond the conventional life cycle of a research article or book. We now have preprints, research data, software, protocols, conference papers, et cetera. All of these research results have far more representations, more than one moment of birth. Open access catalyzes it all. Perhaps it doesn't feel like it for you publishers. You've taken great care to handle the manuscripts following the highest editorial standards, enrich the content, and published it. Afterwards, what then? Perhaps you may even press release it, written front manner, matter for it, place it on the front cover. What a, but what about the profusion of activity I just described, whether before or after the article is published? Perhaps it feels like the content made available to the community lands into a dead zone. The signals aren't getting through, they're hard to find by researchers, institutions trying to track the impact of their faculty. Funders also doing the same for their grants. Indexers, app developers, recommendation engines, etc. This is where metadata becomes part, an important part, I would claim, of the open access story. They enable the connections which lead back to the research itself. Whether your starting point is another article, whether it's data, whether it's software, whether you're a funder looking at a person or research institution looking at your faculty member. The How Open Is It guide actually explicitly points this out. You can read the definition in version two, um, which is really a, a seminal guide. But connections between what, you may ask. There's a profusion of research outputs and artifacts, funders, researchers, a lot of different research outputs, and a lot of activity that goes on on the research that happens outside of the publishing platform. All of these form the webbing of scholarly communications. Some of this, I hope, may sound familiar to you publishers who are Crossref members. Crossref is part of the scholarly infrastructure supporting these, this enterprise. It is part of, in fact, the open access infrastructure, linking you up, making connections across the scholarly web. There are three classes of links um, in my mind, and I'll go through each one of them. But really quickly, they're linking literature and associated research entities, linking literature and associated research outputs, linking literature and the activity surrounding it after publication. For the first class, re associated research entities, we're talking about the people and the places. Whose people, which people, orchids that identify not only authors, but reviewers and editors. We're talking about places, organizations, the affiliations of, the, of all the um, people, as well as the funders and the grants associated with it. But also clinical trials, um, if they're relevant to the type of material you publish, um, as well as bibliographic descriptors, like publication history. Dario mentioned earlier today, corrections, retractions, all of these need to be propagated out. This is part of the metadata in the open scholarly web, which uh, open scholarly map that Crossref is building. Versions, updates, et cetera. Also peer review, whether the status, the type of review, if there are reviews that are published out there, as well as in referencing the earlier talk by Dario, what is also really important are the licenses. Not only that there are open licenses as open access publishers, but that the licenses are made very, very clearly for machines to be able to read when text and data mining as well as, for some publishers, a separate URL specifically built for the machines.
to access. The second class of links are literature linked to associated research outputs. I've made mention of this already. There's an explosion of these different types of outputs um, that have come from researchers as part of the whole process of doing their work. And they are um, increasingly being made available um, in other places beyond your, your platform so that they can be properly cared for, preserved, curated, et cetera. All of these need to get back and linked back to the research article or the book itself. Third class, the, this is links between the literature and the very exciting um, a set of events that happen after publication by the community, by their researchers, et cetera. Um, unlike the prior two classes, uh, which, you know, loosely speaking, come from the publishers and comprise the bibliographic metadata, this is a whole new realm. We know um, very much, we've, you know, uh, heard nonstop in other places about all of these activities, how this digital exhaust is being tracked and can be made available for a whole variety of use cases. And unlike the prior two, Crossref will be launching a new service in Q4 exposing these links between your content and the various platforms where it is shared, read, discussed, mentioned, referenced, reviewed, recommended, etc. It will be called Crossref Event Data. And I just want to make a special note. Um, this is a particular service which the OS, but which would not have happened were it not for the OS, but community that brought it forward and. Um, and convinced our organization to, to build it out. All of these basically get linked up and um, mapped onto this open scholarly map, which comprises the scholarly infrastructure that I spoke of, but none of it would really make any sense. Um, it wouldn't be effective if it wasn't pushed out and actually made openly available to the community, hence open access. So come and get it, robots. We have many interfaces and formats by which this data is made available. We have, there are programmatic libraries to make accessing this data much more easy. Um, but ultimately, it facilitates reuse and the birth or rebirth of OA content's additional lives. So I won't go into any of the specific um, um, entities, but as you can see from this slide, your content, the metadata, and the many lives it might take um, will do already reach all of the entities on this list. In particular, one named earlier today, Publishers, deposit your metadata, it goes to Crossref, and directly from there, Wikipedia um, and Wikidata are picking it up. Question in the room, who in the audience recognizes this person? No, you, you, don't, you don't count. All right, so for those, yes. Leibniz, yes. So it's Gottfried Wilfred Leibniz, a 17th century thinker who was responsible for the many possible worlds concept and philosophy. Many possible worlds, many possible lives for OA content, some of which may represent the best of all possible worlds, will attribute that to OA Leibniz. To sum up open access as a strategy, the end game for many of us is open use. In other words, the untrammeled advancement of the scholarly enterprise. What do we do now to get there? Crossref is here to serve you as infrastructure and support your open access efforts. We need you to help us help you, though. Stop contributing to the data des desert. Information scarcity prevents us from achieving the full potential of open access. Please deposit and share the complete set of metadata. Beyond just the standard bibliographic set, assert all the relationships between the article or the book and other research objects connected to it, what we call the article nexus. There are many, many ways to do it. We'll work with you to find it. I'll give you more information if you come find me afterwards. There are many lives for your OA content. Let's create the best of all possible worlds by depositing all possible metadata. This will make OA Leibniz very, very happy. <laughs> Whoops, did we get the smart? Oh. There we go. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Any questions for Jennifer? Um, could I ask you one just about, just following on from the, something that Daria was talking about this morning about, uh, and connected with yours, so depositing references. So many, many publishers will deposit references currently in Crossref, right? Yes, that is correct. And so, uh, but uh, for the majority of that information is not 
uh, accessible, not, it's not openly available, is that right? Yes, so the way to make your, open, your references open it's two things. One, deposit. Not all publishers are depositing this, and you know who you are. Um, and if you don't come to me, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> the second part is many of you publishers are making, you're inserting the references into the metadata when you register your content, but you're not making it open. That is actually a, an, an additional step. Thank you, Mark. Um, so many of you think that these references are made open, but unless they are specifically, explicitly flagged as such, they are not, in fact. I'm happy to walk through this with you and look at your metadata um, if you wish. It's easy to do, right? I mean, they, they, mm -hmm. so, so what does a publisher need to do in order to open up their references? One, deposit the references in the metadata when you register your content. Two, make sure when you do so that the references are flagged as open. I, I can walk you through the XML and the metadata schema to, 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 to show you through how. Fantastic. Thank Excellent. you. Any other, anything else? All right, well, I think that uh, brings this session to a close, so just please join me in thanking all the speakers.